Christ, welcome to worship. Today. Kind of just get stuck in my um, get stuck in that lilting voice. But um, if you are new with us and that scared you, I'm sorry. But um, uh, we are glad that you're here, um, both here in the sanctuary and those of you who are worshiping with us online. Um, right here as we start the service, we'd, we'd love to ask you, if you would, to take a moment. There's a blue attendance pad at the end of your pew at one end, and whoever's there, if you would take that and sign your name and pass that down to your neighbors, we love to know who's here, and uh, we love to learn people's names. And if you're worshiping with us online, maybe you might just drop your name in the chat or something else so that we can keep up with you as well. Um, there's a lot that I'm excited about uh, in, in being back. One of them is a little later this week on Wednesday night. I'm going to have a chance to tell you a little bit about my trip to Northern Ireland that focused on peacemaking and, and what I learned there about peacemaking that I hope will be a blessing to you in some way. Um, I'm also excited later this week for some of the things that we have coming up, like our, our new Joy Luncheon um, for senior adults that's going to be happening on Friday. And a little bit later in this service, um, some of our youth are going to be sharing about the recent Ignitus retreat that they helped to lead and take part in. And so there's a lot of things that we can celebrate and look forward to today. And um, we hope this time will be a blessing to all of us here and, and to all of you who are at home. So as we get started, if we would, let's take a moment to bow our heads and, uh, and ask God's blessing upon this time. Let us be in prayer. Lord, you know all that is going on in each of our lives, and yet here we are together with you. You are the reason we are here. Lord, we have a desire to know you, to encounter you in, in the prayers, in the singing, in the fellowship, in your word, through the bread and the cup. And we pray, Lord, that through your spirit you would Help us to set aside all distraction, to lay down some of the worries and the burdens that we come here carrying, and that you would help us to turn our hearts and our minds in your direction, to be reminded of your reality, your goodness, your beauty, your love, and your purpose in our life. Let this be a time when we worship you in spirit and in truth, and may all your children be blessed through what we share. We ask all of these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Melanie. Oh, I think you should make them say it in an accent, Jeremy. No, say good morning in an accent, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy, say good morning in an accent. <laughs> Germs! Oh, man. Good morning. Stand and tell your neighbor good morning in whatever accent you deem appropriate. All right, good. <laughs> good morning. I, I worked on it. I worked on it the last Welcome week. Welcome today. I we practiced. are so glad you are here for worship.
Hi, good morning. I'm Randy Wall. I'm the director of youth ministries here at the church. Uh, along with me is Reagan and uh, Reagan Gilman and Ethan Shearer. They're going to talk to you about the Ignitus um, retreat a little bit from their perspective. But we're going to show a quick video first. All right, so the theme of that uh, retreat was actually called Perfectly Imperfect. That's this, uh, I did get that right. Yes, okay. Um, uh, that was the theme of the retreat, and I'm going to let Reagan talk to you a little bit about um, her experience. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I've been to Ignite Us twice now, and both times it's been like an amazing experience that I really cherished, and I feel like... Um, it's really like, like <laughs> great. Um, but this year I got to be in the um, <clears throat> praise and worship band because I play bass guitar. And um, it was really great because it started as like just people from our church, but then there was an opportunity for people from other churches who brought instruments to come and join us. And it was really just a great opportunity to um, come together and just like worship. And it was really special and um, very like impactful and I felt very connected to um, it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I am on CCYM, the Conference Council for Youth Ministries. And it is basically a group of about 20 youth from across the Western North Carolina Conference. And what we would do um, is have bi-monthly meetings and plan Ignite Us. We planned uh, pretty much everything. It's almost entirely youth-led. We do have Shannon Lamaster Smith, who is the coolest person on the earth. Um, and she is kind of, she gets the boring job of doing like all the adulty things, of like handling the money and the logistics and getting people to where they need to be. But the youth handle all of like the actual like meat of the event. They planned, um, all the activities we're doing, um, how things would happen, where people would be, and kind of just everything that did happen. Um, and it was a really great kind of like leadership and like soft skill building thing um, where we learned communication and leadership and argumentative skills, which is very important. Um, and we kind of learned to like bounce ideas off each other and also learn to say, hey, this isn't going to work. We need to do it like this and having the confidence to do that. 
and to speak up and say what is on our mind and what needs to happen. Um, and it all, you kind of get to see the like, the like unfinished, like messy side of planning these events where things don't go perfectly and you learn to improvise and adapt and it's, you figure out that like everything is just gonna be fine and that it's all gonna come together at the end. Um, and it all came together to be Ignitus, which like not to brag is one of like the best trips that we go on. Um, and it's a really amazing interconnected just experience with everyone from across Western North Carolina. There were, I think this year, about 250 youth and adults that came to it. Um, so that just shows like how many people come to this. And the entire environment is so welcoming and like gracious. Like in the video where we were like locking arms and singing Reckless Love, if you saw the little kid that like nudged his way in, we don't know who that kid is. <laughs> Like, he was not part of our group. He was just like, hey, can I come in? And we're like, yeah, of course you can come in. And just the entire weekend had those vibes of like, we were playing basketball, four square, gaga ball, football, uh, well, soccer. Um, but like, we, people would just come up and play and we didn't have to ask their names. They just came up and played. And that was kind of just the welcoming environment that we wanted it to be. And I'm really glad that, that, that it came out the way that it did. Um, thank you. So I, I just want to add, you know, our, our youth did a great job in like welcoming. We were by far the largest group. We had about, we had 41 of us um, at that uh, retreat. And um, what was great is they were always welcoming folks. They were always getting folks to kind of join them, as you can see in the video and everything. And um, it was a really great experience. I'm very proud of who they were um, and the culture that they've built. So, but thank you for supporting us. That's awesome. Thank you. Bye. to come up. I'd love to see you this morning. Good morning. How are you, Eve? Good to see you. Is she here? No, she's not here. Okay, okay. Hi, Emma. Anybody else coming? I see some hiding. They're hiding, they're coming, they're in the back. Okay, so I have a question. Do um, you guys ever get scared about things? Hi, Naimat. How you doing today? Good. Good. It's good to see you guys um, and those that are in the back still hiding. Um, so do you guys ever get afraid or scared of anything? Yes. Yes? You want to share what any of those are or not? Yes. What? Losing my favorite Losing your favorite stuffed animal, that can be a biggie, I know. Do you guys that are older, do you, do you ever stress over tests in school? Yes, yeah, trying to get things right, anxiety and fear, it just kind of wears us down, doesn't it? Would anybody like to be my friend and try to put this backpack on? Mm -hmm. Emma, go for it, let's see. Oh, oh, is it heavy, yeah. very heavy? Do you want to try, name it, you want to try to carry it? it? It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. You want to try it? Done. 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 Okay. But is it heavy? A little. A little. Yeah. Eve, you want to try it? Honey, this is going to knock you down. Look at that girl go. Okay. Woohoo! That's not heavy. Okay. Good job. All right. Well, I thought it was pretty heavy. And this backpack represents, I have items in it that, that kind of represent all of the scary things or the things that worry us or the things that burden us. And it's heavy and it's hard. So let me, let me ask you again, Emma, if you were carrying this backpack with all of your burdens and all of your worries and all the things you're afraid of, and I said, I'll trade you, I'll give you this. It's a much lighter load. It's a much lighter load. Would you take that easily and give me the heavy stuff back? Yes. Yes. How about you? Would you trade? Would you trade? Yes. yes. You would trade and take the easier thing, the lighter thing. You know, this is exactly what God does for us. That's exactly what God does for us. 
He takes those things that worry us and that scare us and that make us feel heavy and burdened. And he says, how about I give you my peace and I'll take all those heavy things on myself. He wants to lighten our load by giving us peace. And the Bible is full of examples of that. But one of those examples is the story when Jesus, after Jesus died and he rose again, the disciples were hiding in a room because they were afraid. They were scared. They had seen Jesus be arrested and killed. And they were afraid that they were going to be arrested too. Would that frighten you? Mm -hmm. It would scare me too. So they were all huddled up together in this room. And guess who showed up? Jesus shows up. And the first thing Jesus says to them is, Peace be with you. Let me take your burdens. Let me take your fear. Let me take your worries. And I will give you instead my peace. Because his peace is so much easier to live with. Not only does Jesus give us peace, he gives us other people in our lives to help us, to encourage us and teach us and pray for us and love us and serve with us and help us. So Jesus says, peace be with you. So guys, today we can trade in all of these heavy things that worry us and scare us and burden us down. And what does Jesus give us? in exchange for that, his peace. And who, who gets the heavy stuff? God does. Jesus does. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you, re- you guys ready to pray before we go with our little stuffed, peaceful friend? Okay, name Matt, we're going to pray. All righty. Dear God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Jesus' peace. peace. Help us to trust you. Help us to not fear. We love you and we praise you we in Jesus' precious, precious name. And all of God's children together say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying with me, sweetheart. That was awesome. Would you like to carry that? You may. Thank you, my love. You think that's heavy? That's not bad? Is yours worse? ...who participate in that time. It brings us so much joy. Now we come to a time when we enter into our prayer of confession together. Um, I'm going to ask that you'll join me with the words on the screen... Uh, After that, we will have a moment of silence uh, upon which, after a moment, I will invite us into the words of pardon. So let us pray together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Now hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ as well rose for us and reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. 
In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, as part of our worship, we also have the tradition of taking up an offering. Now, at this time in the, the service of worship, we also recognize that there would be someone possibly here who is visiting. We would never want a visitor to feel obligated at all to have to put something into the plate. But this is, like I said, a part of when we recognize that everything we have comes from God. And I just have a couple of verses that I think invite us into this moment of the worship. And it says in Psalm 96, Ascribe to the Lord everyone, all the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Let us now enter into this part of our worship. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Rick Class. This is my daughter, Callie, Cl uh, Callie Class. Uh, she's going to be reading this morning from John 20, verses 19 to 23. Uh, before I turn it over to her, I have to share a very quick story that I think, uh, especially the parents in here who've had children transition from a preteen to a teenager might enjoy. So when I told her I was reading the scripture, she, of course, asked if she could, could read it with me, and that, that's fine. But she said, Daddy, this, this time, do you mind if, if either Della or Andrew or Shelton and, or Cameron come up instead of you to, to read it? So uh, I'm slowly learning that's, that's a part of the process. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
<clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of any. They are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Would you be in prayer with me, please? Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak and be heard, that you'd open our hearts and our minds even more fully to you, that this would be more than just one person's reflections or thoughts, but God, that that you would make this a living word that would speak to us and in some way bless and challenge us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Jerry McConville and Harry Stockton once wanted to kill each other. As teenagers, they had grown up on opposite sides of the divided city of Belfast in Northern Ireland, separated from each other by barricades and checkpoints, sworn enemies who sometimes threw rocks at each other over the so-called peace walls that separated their neighborhoods in the city. Jerry, um, on the left, was a Roman Catholic from an Irish nationalist family. That meant his people, who were the minority in Northern Ireland, longed to see Northern Ireland leave the United Kingdom and be reunited with the predominantly Catholic nation of the Republic of Ireland. Harry, on the other hand, had grown up Protestant and was from a loyalist family. His people, who made up the majority in Northern Ireland, wanted to stay loyal to the Queen and remain part of the predominantly British Isles. Each believed that the other and his people was ruining their country. So they grew from fearful teenagers into angry young men. And Jerry and Harry advanced from throwing rocks at each other to shooting bullets in each other's direction. They each joined competing paramilitary groups, which were kind of like violent gangs, in order to defend their people from the angry and violent young men who were on the other side. Jerry became part of the provisional Irish Republican Army, the IRA, and he joined after loyalists had set fire to his Catholic neighborhood, leaving many people homeless. And after he had witnessed occupying British soldiers ransack some of his neighborhood's houses and even kill his 14-year-old friend, Desi. Jerry thought of himself as a freedom fighter who was trying to free his people from colonial oppression. On the other side, Harry, after witnessing British soldiers brutally killed by members of Jerry's IRA joined the Ulster Volunteer Force, or UVF. And he did so in his mind to defend his family and his people and the police from depraved terrorists like Jerry. And he viewed it as his mission to get rid of people like Jerry. Both Jerry and Harry became what were called gunmen. Both committed acts of violence. At one point, Harry and his friends unsuccessfully attempted to have Gary killed. Both men wound up going to prison for their crimes. But both Jerry McConville and Harry Stockton were also changed. Both men came to renounce the violence that had seized them when they were angry young men. Both resolved to help bring the violent conflict to an end. And today, even though Jerry and Harry wouldn't describe themselves as best friends, they would tell you they are no longer enemies. 
In fact, now every month they sit down with each other as part of the Belfast Conflict Resolution Consortium where they talk about how to peacefully address any challenges that arise between their minority and majority communities. Today, both Jerry and Harry work with disadvantaged young people from the inner city to promote education. They give talks to student groups, even visiting groups from Israel and Palestine about the horrors of violent sectarian conflict. Both warn about the dangers that you can fall into when you come to view another group of human beings as something a little bit less than human beings like you. And both are now giving their lives to make sure their grandchildren never experience the kind of societal conflict and trauma that they have. The Northern Ireland peace accords that were signed in Belfast on Good Friday 1998 have turned Jerry McConville and Harry Stockton into peacemakers. And what I want you to know today is that Good Friday and Easter Sunday do the same for all of us. They turn us into peacemakers. On Sunday night, barely two days after Jesus was executed, Jesus' disciples are still cowering in fear. The disciples are afraid that the authorities want to kill them, that having done away with Jesus, they'll be coming to crucify them next. John even says that the disciples have locked the doors in fear of the so-called Jews. Of course, all of Jesus' disciples are themselves Jewish. So that means they have become afraid of their own countrymen and view them as the enemy. Like Jerry and like Harry, because of the trauma they have suffered at the hands of a few, the disciples now imagine themselves engaged in a kind of civil war, a religious sectarian conflict. Their own people have become the other. They might as well be living in the Northern Ireland of Harry and Jerry's youth, ducking behind a wall, separated from others by barricades and checkpoints. And yet the risen Jesus somehow gets past all those defenses. The risen Jesus jumps over the walls and passes through the closed gates and slips through the locked doors. And the risen Jesus comes to his disciples, his frightened disciples, in that cramped airless space of fear of the other and conflict and there twice Jesus says these words for emphasis peace be with you peace be with you peace is God's ultimate will for all human beings But it's not just any kind of peace that God desires for God's children. The risen Jesus greets his scared friends with the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. Now the Hebrew word shalom is a rich word. It is a much richer word than our English word for peace or our Spanish word for pause. Shalom refers to much more than just a period of time where people aren't killing each other or yelling at each other. And it's so much more than just feeling relaxed and peaceful inside. The word shalom refers to a permanent condition of wholeness, of completeness, of joyful well-being, and of perfect health. And shalom wasn't just used to describe one person's individual reality, but it was a communal reality. Shalom was a word that described what happens when everything in a complex system works together perfectly. We never really think about this, but that's what health is. That's what life is. When all the individual parts and organs cohere and are interacting and working together in just the right way to produce something that's greater than the sum of the parts. The great Jewish rabbi and Hebrew scholar Jonathan Sachs wrote once that shalom is that fullness of being that we discover when our individual gifts combine for the common good. That is peace. I heard a story once about a Hebrew auto mechanic. He was working on a sputtering, skipping engine whose timing was off. 
And when the mechanic finally got the engine fixed, he started up the car and then he put his ear to the hood to listen to the motor to check it out. And when he heard it purring perfectly, every part sparking and firing and turning together in sublime synchronicity, he smiled and he said with a satisfied sigh, Shalom! (laughs) That is the kind of peace Shalom refers to. Where nothing is left out, where everything combines to become more than the parts where all works and flows together as the creator intends. And so it's no wonder in Jesus' time when people greeted each other, their first word to each other would be shalom. And when people said goodbye to each other and took their leave from each other, their last word would be shalom. Because that kind of peace was the first word and the last word that expressed God's desire for every person and every group of people. Shalom. When you think about it, shalom is just another word for salvation. Because when we use the word salvation, what are we referring to? Is a state of peace with God and peace with each other and peace with ourselves. The whole Bible, when it comes down to it, is the description of a kind of peace process that we are invited into. Salvation is the peace process through which God turns our fear, our animosity, our sin, our hatred into friendship and wholeness and joy and peace in which God creates shalom. It's that kind of peace that Jesus offers the disciples that first Easter night. Shalom be with you. Peace be with you. That is why he has risen. That is why he has come. To make peace. To offer people peace with God. Peace with each other. Peace with themselves. And he has come to enable all things to join together in that kind of beautiful oneness. Because Jesus died and was raised. We have peace with God. You have peace with God. Shalom. Jesus says to you. To us. Peace. But then the reason Jesus doesn't just stop there. Jesus doesn't just give the gift of shalom and peace to his disciples. He also calls them to become instruments of that shalom that salvation peace themselves. Do you remember what Jesus says after he wishes them peace? He says, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Just as the Father has sent me to show and offer shalom, now you are to go and do the same. Peacemaking, it's not just a nice thing for some people to do. It's not even an optional extra course for super advanced Christians or high diplomats. The Bible says the the making of peace is the essence of what the Christian life is about. It's the calling of each and every follower of Jesus that we make peace to the extent we are able in our families, in our workplaces, in our churches, in our communities, in our nation. Reconciliation isn't just part of the gospel, it is the gospel. Salvation is peace. Sanctification is a peace process. That is what God does, is make peace. And so that is what God's children are called to seek as well. Whenever the church helps people who've been disconnected from God to become reconnected. When the church helps people reconnect with each other who've been separated from each other. When the church helps people reconnect with their truest selves and their soul. When they have become separated from their truest selves and their soul. We are fulfilling the mission of Jesus. We are doing what we were put on this earth to do. You know, as I mentioned at the open of this service, after Easter, 
a group of United Methodist ministers traveled to Northern Ireland as part of a learning cohort with a group called Rethinking Conflict. And we were there to learn from the experience of Christians in Northern Ireland about how we can better be peacemakers in a world, in a culture, even in a church sometimes that can be so divided in this time we're living through. And this Wednesday night at 6.45 here in the sanctuary, I'm looking forward to sharing a presentation about the trip, some of the stories I've learned, some of the lessons I've learned about peace, and why I think those things are important for the the time and the place that we are all living through together right now. But I think one of the main things I learned is that conflict is easy, but peace is really hard. Building shalom is a daily thing. It is a constant work. I have learned that there are things that are required for true peace to ever happen, like a reckoning with the pain that's been caused. But I've also seen that peace is possible. Even among people who have hurt each other deeply. But for peace to happen, what peace requires is for human beings to have the courage to step across the visible and invisible divisions of their place and time and to have conversations and to form relationships with others whom they fear or even hate. It comes through relationship, courageous relationship. I want to leave you with this. One such person from Northern Ireland who is a peacemaker is this man named Richard Moore. Richard Moore tells his story in a documentary we watched called Once Upon a Time in Northern Ireland. And Richard Moore was a primary school child in the months that followed Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday was an incident in which British soldiers fired into a crowd and killed 13 unarmed Catholic protesters in the city of Derry. One of the dead was Richard's uncle. Well, after the funerals of the victims of Bloody Sunday, everyone was angry and on edge, including the British soldiers in the area. And Richard was at school. And at the bottom of his primary school playground, the army had set up a lookout post. One afternoon, as 10-year-old Richard ran home from school past that army lookout post, a soldier fired that rubber bullet And it hit him on the bridge of the nose and knocked him unconscious. Richard woke up in an ambulance but couldn't see anything. He thought it was because of the bandage he was wearing. But after receiving 54 stitches on his face, his brother informed him that he would now be blind for the rest of his life. Richard said that he took the news in stride at first, but that night he broke down and cried when he realized that he would never see the face of his mother and father ever again. But Richard went on with life, and he lived a good life. He even started an international charity called Children in the Crossfire that sought to help children in places that are war zones. But he also felt there was a further healing and calling that was needed. And so after the signing of the Good Friday Peace Accords in Belfast in 1998, Richard made a decision to think about his story in the context of forgiveness and reconciliation. Richard decided to find out the name of the soldier who had shot him and blinded him many years before. He felt he was now ready after many years. And so he wrote to the man and said, I would like to meet you sometime. The ex-soldier, to his credit, agreed. And when they met, Richard said it was nerve-wracking. Richard said to him, look, Charles, I'm not here to be confrontational. I'm here because I just wanted to say to you, in case you wondered, that I forgive you. And Charles thanked Richard for that, but he also became a little defensive. And he said, Richard, hear me. I I wish you had not had to suffer so much, but you should know that I still feel justified in firing that shot because of all that was going on. And, and I, I don't feel guilty about it. It was what I had to do. Well, that's not exactly the response Richard had been hoping for, but he chose to accept it. 
And, and in the film, he explains, if we want reconciliation, we can't meet the person we would like to meet. You have to meet them for who they are. He said, I could nail Charles to a cross and it's not going to make one bit of difference in my life. It's not going to give me back my eyesight. It's not going to make me any happier. But what has made me happy has been trying to find a way that Charles and I could know each other and even become friends. Richard wound up going with Charles along with a camera crew to visit the school where their lives had tragically intersected. And in that moment, captured on film, Charles appears overcome with emotion and becomes silent. It's clear that he is hurting. That he is carrying guilt and trauma about the incident too. That he needs healing. But Richard reaches out to him and touches him and says, Charles... Are you all right? At the close of the testimony, Richard says, You know, some people said to me, I shouldn't have met him till he apologized. But if I had done that, then me and Charles's journey would never have begun. And now finding out who he was changes everything. He's no longer a soldier, he's a human being, he's a father, he's a grandfather. It makes a person very real. Sometimes peace comes slowly, he said. But it's worth working for and waiting for. Richard says peace is tough, but we've got to keep working at it because we never know where it's going to lead to. One night, six years after they had met and become friends, Charles turned to Richard and said, Richard, I'm so sorry. Peace, shalom, salvation. What Richard does for Charles is what the risen Jesus does for us. He comes to us who have betrayed him or forgotten him or who have scarred him or others. And before the words of confession or apology or even out of our mouths, he says to us, peace. He offers us peace. And he invites us into that peace process called salvation. And then Christ says, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Spread shalom and make peace. It will be tough, but we've got to keep working at it. And we never know where it might lead us. Maybe even straight into the kingdom of God. Glory to God. Amen. Now as we come to the Lord's table, please hear these words. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of our sin and seek to live in peace one with another. Now please stand for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It It is is right right to give give our our thanks thanks and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. 
blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you give birth to your church. They delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. We remember now how the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you, O God. And we remember how he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim and sing together the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, your spirit that makes things happen that are beyond our power or understanding. And we ask that you would pour out that spirit on these gifts of bread and juice, that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, a people of peace who are at peace. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. Make us one with each other. Make us one in ministry to all your world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast then at his heavenly banquet at the supper of shalom that you have prepared for your children. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. confidence of the children of God, let us join together in the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated, and if our communion assistants can please come forward to their stations.
come forward and to receive at one of the four stations here. If you'd come, come down and you'll receive the bread, the body of Christ, which you can take and eat. And then you can take the cup, the blood of Christ, which you can then drink. You can return your cup to the altar railing. If there's room, you can stay and pray. Or you can return to your seat around the outside. If you need a, a gluten-free wafer instead of the bread, if you'll just mention that to us, we'd be happy to provide that for you. If you're upstairs, it might be easier to go to one of the side stations, which is a little less crowded. Um, and we'll just kind of go from the, the front to the back as our ushers lead us. But now, as you feel led, would you come and receive this gift of peace and love which Christ offers us today?
Let us pray. Let us especially remember Kay Rankin, that's Ronica's mother who we've been praying for, who's in Beacon Place. Today, oh God, hearing about salvation and complete peace that you offer, not like the world offers, but Jesus, your peace is perfect. Pour over us now with your Holy Spirit. Continue to unite us as we have been during this special time. And although we are mere humans that you've made similar to clay, continue to mold us, guide us in your way at all time. For we know that your mercy, your grace abounds. Your love is eternal. Today, God, we pray for each one who is grieving or infirm. We pray, God, that you would give comfort, that you would restore health, that you would help each one of us receive in a complete way your peace and that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit to continue continue our work here, your work that is of love and grace, that we might truly be seen as those who make peace because we walk in your love, in faith, and in hope in you. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Shout Hosanna. Celebrate the coffee with the pastors. I'll be right down in the parlor as well as the other pastors coming alongside if you can, if you're visiting and would like to stop and get to know us better. We also have this afternoon a time for kids to play out in the back parking lot. Uh, it starts at 3 and goes till 4.30. I understand you can bring your scooter or your bicycle as well. It should be great fun. Uh, we have Wednesday night Pastor Jeremy's presentation about his peacemaking journey in Ireland right here in the sanctuary 645. And on Thursday we have a blood drive. So please, if you're well and can give, give the gift of life. Now, by the grace of God, let us go in peace and let us make peace. And may the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.